Hello again. I came across this book in the library the other day. It is called A Hundred Great Black Britons and it really is a most peculiar piece of work. As a child, I used to love books with titles like this, you know, 50 Great Britons or something. They would usually contain details of heroes and famous people who had actually done something worthwhile. You might read of Scott of the Antarctic, Charles Darwin, Churchill and so on. This book, on the other hand, is filled up for the main part with accounts of pop singers and models. People who have really done nothing noteworthy, brave or heroic. Their main achievement seems to have been in being black while living in Britain. For example, John Black, the Tudor trumpeter, is to be found here. But I have no idea what it is that makes him a great Briton. Like many others, he blew a trumpet on ceremonial occasions. But that is hardly a remarkable achievement in itself. The only notable thing about him is, as I say, that he was probably black. I shall do a video looking more closely at this book soon, but I do not have very high hopes for the quality of the research behind it. I say this because, of course, Mary Seacole is in it, and out of curiosity, <laughs> I read the entry. I'm used to the sloppy and dishonest things which are said about this woman, but even so, I must confess to having been taken aback by the sheer cheek of what the two authors have to say about Mary Seacole. Let me read a couple of bits from it. She was a woman of colour who often travelled without a chaperone, who self-financed her journey to the Crimea, setting up her own boarding house to treat sick and injured soldiers. This is, of course, quite untrue. She didn't run a boarding house in the Crimea of any description, either for sick or injured soldiers or anybody else. She opened a restaurant which was only for the use of officers, and none stayed the night there. The next bit I found absolutely staggering. Where are we now? She was a skilled medical practitioner who developed treatments for yellow fever and cholera, two of the deadliest diseases of the time. Right. What are these treatments which Mary Seacole devised for helping those suffering from cholera and yellow fever? That is easily discovered and the answer is pretty shocking. How did I find out what Seacole was doing? And what she, as a skilled medical practitioner, was treating people with? Did I have to research in musty old archives and libraries? Of course not. The book which she wrote is freely available online and I give a link to it in the description to this video. I invite readers to click on the link and then turn to chapter 4 where C. C. Cole describes what she was doing. I quote, and this is a treatment for cholera. Mustard plasters and emetics, emetics are things that make you vomit, and calomel, the mercury applied externally where the veins were nearest the surface were my usual resources. Then she says she avoids opium. One stubborn attack succumbed to an additional dose of 10 grains of sugar of lead mixed in a pint of water given in doses of a tablespoonful every quarter of an hour. Mary Seacole was dissolving lead acetate, which she called sugar of lead, in water and getting cholera patients to drink it. Lead acetate is poisonous. Again, I invite readers, don't take my word for it, uh, do a bit of research on the internet, look up sugar of lead and lead acetate and see if it's recommended that anybody take it. She was also applying calomel, that's spelt C-A-L-O-M-E-L, -E which is mercury oxide, to the skin near veins so that the mercury could be absorbed into the bloodstream. Mercury is also poisonous, which is why cosmetics containing it are illegal in this country. It poisons people. 
The bloody woman was poisoning cholera patients with mercury and lead. Are the authors of this book quite mad that they describe her as a skilled medical practitioner who developed treatments for cholera? No. The explanation is that when I looked at what sources they cited for that chapter, I found they had relied upon two books which were published in 2005. They have never bothered to read Mary Seacole's only own account of what she was doing. Shocking negligence. We read to... She presented herself at the war office to serve as a hospital nurse, but her offer was rejected. Undeterred, she approached the quartermaster general's department and the medical department, who also rebuffed her applications. Her attempt to appeal to the Crimean Fund also failed. Facing the fact that her skin colour was the reason for her rejection, she resolved to travel to the Crimea independently. This is another popular lie which uh, reading Seacole's book might have dispelled had they been able to be bothered. But I've seen this popular story elsewhere. It's a lie. It's nothing to do with the skin colour. The nurses that went to the Crimea with Florence Nightingale had to make written applications and they had to give two references. That's all it amounted to. Seacole wouldn't make a written application, nor would she provide references. She just kept turning up at various offices, trying to pester people into arranging for her to travel for nothing or to give her money and so on. Nothing at all to do with the colour of her skin. I don't hold out much hope for the rest of the book, but we shall see. What I have already observed is that, like most books written by black people about black history, the authors only consult modern books by other people who have already told silly stories, and so the legends tend to grow and perpetuate. If only they would just take the trouble to read Mary Seacole's own account of her life, which anybody can do for nothing, then things may not be this way. Black history has thus become a legendary account of the origins, a series of myths, rather than history in the sense that most of us would use the word to mean.